Good morning. Uh, welcome to the library. My name is Troy Swanson. I'm the library department chair. Um, it's good to see all of you here today. This is the first uh, talk in our STEM series. So throughout this fall, we'll have um, different experts in STEM careers come in and talk about what they do, um, how they got there. Uh, it's, it's a really excellent series. This also is a joint event with our One Book, One College series on Isaac Asimov's book, uh, I, Robot. So if you haven't read that, you can, of course, get it here in the library. You can also buy it in the bookstore. Um, it challenges us to think about how machine learning and technology integrates with our lives, which I think is really on topic for what we're going to talk about today. Um, so this is, it's my pleasure to welcome Jim Vandekastiel. Jim is a good friend of mine, and I thank him for the time he spent getting ready for today and for his time um, talking to us today. Um, just real quick, a short little bio about Jim. Um, Jim is a uh, senior sales engineer at Re Resolve Systems. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree in computer engineering from Iowa State University. So thank you all for coming again. Thank you, Jim, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Troy. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, everyone, for coming out to uh, listen to me for a little bit today. Really didn't know uh, what to expect as far as turnout, and I'm uh, pleasantly surprised to see all of you here today. I like to keep things interactive. So as you have questions, thoughts come into your head, please do share those. Just raise your hand up, and uh, we'll get to you. Uh, I like to, uh, again, keep things interactive. First off, who's ever heard of a degree in computer engineering? So a handful of you. So when I had started out back in uh, 1999 in college, it was a very new uh, program to, to, again, to Iowa State University. I had always been interested in engineering. I had a very deep um, like for math and science. And I know we have a lot of you from the uh, Calc 3 course today. That was, uh, again, one of the uh, math courses that I had to, had to go through as part of an uh, engineering degree. It was also very heavy in physics, which again is all, all based on math, so all the stuff I liked to do and was good at doing. And then it combined two other areas that, that really interested me as well. I had always you know, tinkered with computers growing up. You know, I was there for the dial-up days of, uh, of modems that, that most of you probably haven't had to go through. But it was always, you know, how does that stuff work? How is, you know, I'm connecting to somebody's phone line and we're playing a, a video game against each other. Those types of things were I what interested me and really what goes into kind of that program. And then also the aspect of electrical engineering. So how are circuits done? How are, um, you know, communications done from, from one system to another? So, you know, those things kind of really led me into uh, thinking that this was the area that I, that I wanted to study in and this was, um, you know, where I wanted to, to pursue a career in after, uh, after school. So that brings me to what I wanted to do. I thought circuit design was great. You know, there's circuits in computers, there's circuits in your phones, your, now your refrigerators. And, you know, as it keeps building and, you know, technology keeps growing, there's all those need for those sorts of things. So, you know, that was what I thought I wanted to, to get out in the, in the real world and do. And, you know, I was just talking with, uh, with Troy a bit here, and it was kind of like, you know, where did I really start out in. I you know, did a few interviews on doing VLSI, circuit design. I took some interviews doing programming, doing hardcore development, and none of those really resonated with where I wanted to be. And ultimately enough, my wife who joined us today um, <laughs> ended up getting me a job at a consulting company. And that consulting company did uh, services integration for software. So. Um, I'll get into a little bit more on kind of that area and how I had never heard of it, and it's this you know big area that I'm uh, still involved with uh, with today. But kind of starting out there, I was going out to company after company, and I was really experiencing what the different um, kind of you know company lifestyles were like. You know, going to an office every day, go to the coffee room, get your coffee. Go to your cube, do your work, you know, do some socialization. Whereas, you know, I'm mixing it up, and I really like that. You know, I might have been on the road 100 days a year, but it really got me to see um, all those different areas. So, you know, things to think about are how do you work that you can make you the most successful that you think you want to be, and that really comes with you know where you're working. Currently, I work at home. I have an office. It's fantastic. <laughs> It's um, you know a really different thing. You have to learn to manage yourself well, and you know 
think about that as you're, as you're going through kind of the interview process and the, and the career searching process of what is going to make me be the most effective that I can be. So as I uh, started out at the, uh, the bottom of the consultancy, um, moved up to uh, managing a group of people, ultimately running a, uh, a team of consultants that um, uh, made sure that you know, everybody's got the right skill set, we're getting trained, and that sort of thing. I also ran a um, solution engineering group. So it was actually a kind of DevOps development group uh, within, uh, within our software company. So um, kind of seen a few things with there. And that really leads me to you know, where I am today. I get a kick out of these, uh, these slides of you know, what people think I do from, uh, from different perspectives, right? So as a uh, sales engineer, I work for a software company, so I'm primarily focused in at selling that software. I'm presenting it from a more technical aspect, so really understanding the, the inner workings of things, and that kind of does look like my office down there in the lower right. A bunch of screens and uh, doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that uh, we are able to uh, present things that we're able to achieve what we're looking for, which is all very deeply entwined in the technology that we're working with. And getting back to the whole um, you know, computer engineering aspect of it, you know, they're designing all these complex systems. I assume most of you have a phone. How many know how it actually works for me to send an email? Or how it actually works to open a web browser and, and go on the internet? There are hundreds and thousands of different systems and different computers supporting that. And that's ultimately what, you know, kind of that engineering aspect of um, you know, what I had initially looked to do is building out. So if you've heard of the 5G, the fifth generation network for phones, again, that's all systems that are being specifically designed and built to support a higher bandwidth so that we can get more social media, we can stream more systems so that we can be you know, interactive and, um, and in those communications. This was a fun one up, up in the top. That's actual fiber lines that run from Europe to the US. So there's a whole nother area of here's what's supporting the communications. Here's what's supporting you being able to go on the internet. Here's what's supporting you being able to, to make a phone call and, and further out your communication. And as you look at each different technology, whether it be your phone, whether it be you know, the, the TV you're, you're watching, um, and how you're connected, there are a set of systems that have all been designed and built to support those particular things. They can range from, there's little ones in the cabinet here, to a voice switch that's the size of a couple refrigerators. It's uh, very interesting the level of complexity that these systems are built on that are supporting you know, the stuff that we're you know, taking for granted every day. Does anyone have any, have any questions for me so far? So it's great when these things work, but we all know they don't always work, right? There's always the times when, oh, I'm on one, one X, I can't get on the, uh, the internet. I'm, you know, my internet's down, it's not working. Who here has called or chatted with a help desk? So the help desk has the perspective of, you're calling me and telling me something's going wrong. And we have all of these different systems that are, that are supporting what you're doing. There's another set of systems on the back end that you've never seen, I had never heard of in school, that are supporting everything that's going on. And that's a whole other area that, um, that you know, I've had a lot of uh, uh, personal experience with. When I talked about being a, a systems integrator, this was the stuff that we were um, putting out there. It's how do I make sure those services that you know, we're all consuming are working correctly. So there's this whole kind of behind the scenes world of, of monitoring. And it's been for a very long time that, that you know, when you're calling in, they, they're not aware of those things that are, that are going on. They're not aware that um, a backhoe cut a uh, line someplace and that's why the internet's out. 
actually one of the most common problems that uh, causes networks to, to function is actual uh, physical cables breaking. So working in kind of the, the monitoring space, it's been how do I enable people, skilled engineers, to be able to go out and say, okay, I know this is wrong and I know how to fix it. Or I know how to troubleshoot it and send somebody out in a truck to go out and um, you know, re-splice the cables together. So there's been a kind of a, a, a disconnect there. And um, you know, again, this is a, an area I had never heard of, the kind of the whole network and operations uh, center monitoring space, but very heavy into communications and understanding how it all works and being able to, to quickly troubleshoot that and, and bring it back. Any uh, questions for me so far? So now it's my turn to ask a, a question then. What do you think machine learning is? Anyone have an idea? It's not a wrong answer. It's a lot of things. Um, what I've seen through, uh, through my journey here is going back, we're finally starting to let one side know of the other because we take data in, and that can be from a lot of different areas. We take kind of unstructured data and structure it. Now, once you've structured data, you can now take it and apply logic to it. And that logic is saying, here's what's a good thing to happen. Here's what's a bad thing to happen. And then normalize that and kind of ignore the, uh, the outliers, right? The things that don't really fit into what the rest of uh, the things are going on. And now we can do something with that. And what we're seeing is that oftentimes before you're calling in saying, my system isn't working, they're already proactively notifying you, right? So my cable internet's down, but my cell phone still works. I'm going to go look in. And you'll see here, we already know of the problem. We see a resolution time of this. And that's really how they're starting to take the data from all these communication systems, pull it all together, and then be able to apply some logic and learning on top of that to say, here's what you need to go look at to fix, and here's how we you know, keep our customers happy by notifying them from the aspect of, I've learned what to do in these particular scenarios. Questions about that? No? So how many of you are already experiencing the effects of machine learning? Anyone? Maybe you don't realize it? Ever gone on Amazon, shop for something, and said, because you looked for this, here's recommendations? That is a very key aspect of machine learning. Based on what you're doing, what other people are doing, they're able to take all of that data, combine it together, and figure out here's the next best set of information for you. See it with, uh, with, with uh, the Google Maps and directions as well. Um, and it's huge in social media. Because you made a comment on somebody's information saying, hey, I like this product. Guess what you're going to start seeing? Advertisements for that product, right? That is you know, where we are all experiencing this information. And what that ultimately is doing is taking us from static websites that we used to have to enriched information that's customized to us based on you know, the things that we like, based on the things that we may not like. So if you, you know, see ads and you click them away, oh, okay, now we've learned that that's a negative behavior. Don't show me those type of ads again. And all of that information is then feeding back into systems that are um, you know, ultimately producing a unique experience for each person. You know, we were talking about, um, you know, does machine learning solve everything? No. What machine learning is doing and what we're seeing it in the, uh, in the areas that I'm in particular is it's making things get solved faster. It's identifying the, the more complex problems. So now you're using more skilled resources to be able to troubleshoot those. So you're not just calling off calling into an offshore system where somebody is 
um, just answering the phone to route you to somebody else. Let's have that information in order to give you a more enriched experience. Um, one particular one that, that uh, I find really neat that we ran into is uh, one of our customers, when you call in, they take your phone number and they go do a test on everything that you have. They know exactly all the equipment you have in your house. They know what your billing status is. And now instead of just having somebody answer the phone, they're sending you to the appropriate area where you can say, okay, well, you need to pay your bill because it's past due, right? That's why your service isn't working. Or we're aware of this problem and we're working to fix it. You should have a, you know, any TA time of an hour. It's all driving us to be more efficient. It's not driving things away. In some cases, there are some things that you can automatically restart to, to fix it, but it's really leading you to kind of that area of you know, how I discover something. Any questions or topics? On? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, th they know up to the point of their equipment. That's it. Yeah, there, there's not really any, any drivers going beyond that. They know if you have a cable set-top box every time they change the channel, that's all you know, sent back and, and tracked. But from the aspect of within your house, yes, you're absolutely correct. Your own stuff, you know, there, is a, a, there is a lot of privacy layer to this, but when you start putting too many blockers on it, it takes away from that experience for you. But yeah, any um, you know all the you know phone calls you make are, are logged. We've actually I've actually done things where we've gone through and had to search call records because it was part of an um, investigation going on by the police agency. So that's a thing. Well, when you're in a car, your car is hitting a lot of towers. You have a lot of places to go for information. How do I take that information and more efficiently be able to access it and present it back to those that, that need it? Yes. I want to ask you know, job questions. That seems to be the number one issue that I hear about machine learning. Mm -hmm. Won't be jobs in the future because they'll all be replaced by robots. That will do our job. So, good question. So, um, I'll just go ahead. So, kind of where I, I fit in, the things I do today is really around the automation. And um, we actually created an automation that was so efficient at solving one problem, it saved more time than they had people working. You can't get rid of everybody just because you solved one problem. And really where the, the machines and the automations come in is how do I gather that information faster so that I don't want to have a, a, a job where I'm just running the same thing all day long. They do. We have, uh, I've seen operation centers. I see this problem. I have to spend 10 minutes to gather the information. Let's not do that. Let's give you the information you need to solve the problem. Because ultimately, the problems are unique. It's not just the same thing over and over again. So from the, from the, the job aspect of it, people don't go away just because an automation solved one problem, because it solved 10 problems. You can only actually really get to about 8 to 10% of the problems that are going on by automatically doing them. So where the human fits in is let's make a decision about this. Let's use that information that we're able to present from those other areas and give it to somebody to make a decision. You know, ultimately, I talked about the backhoe running over a line is a problem. The next biggest problem is change. When somebody goes into a device and changes something, guess what, my mic doesn't work now. Or now the internet traffic got black holed and nobody has internet. Things like that are what's causing the problem. And those changes, because of the complexity of all the systems, don't ultimately get solved by a machine. We can learn as much as we want about all the networks and everything that are making that up, but ultimately it's about you know, identifying things from change and making the uh, corrections from there. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? Is there Anyone still have any hesitations or anything? When you say, you know, at some point in the future, that we can take over the problem, the robots will solve it, then you're saying we won't need to take that, or we won't need to take that chance. 
Absolutely. I think that that'll go up from what we've seen, but I don't think it's going to be that all-encompassing self-healing, everything's doing it on its own. Because ultimately, when you look at machine learning, it's made up of a set of rules. And those rules are defining good behavior, bad behavior. But it's all only as good as we're going to teach it what to do. Because remember, it is all based on a set of rules. And the outcome of those rules are the data that's, that's going into it. So it is as good as your data that's coming in and as well as your ability to write the rules around it. But again, we're always teaching and building rules for an outcome that we're, that we're looking for, right? I'm writing rules to look at network patterns that are going to tell me this one's overloaded. Shift the, shift the information. And maybe that's automatic, or maybe it's not. But once it learns to shift it, do I want it to always do that? And that's one of the things that have, you know, kind of have really grounded everything is, do I really want to let it start making those actions itself? Or are those actions going to cause consequences and then put it in a loop where it just constantly you know, doesn't know when to stop? Again, but it's all based on, on rules. So we see, uh, see that a lot. Any other, uh, yes? So are the simple task jobs going to be audited? No. They will, I, I don't see them being completely automated away because your uh, automation is always going to be a structured set of rules. And there's always going to be things that don't work out from that particular set of rules. So things always fall through. Somebody changed a password and I can't log in. I, I'm not going to learn what the password is. Right? There's always going to be those sorts of uh, sets of roles that are going to, to be there from, again, from my perspective, what I'm seeing. Yes? Exactly. And there's always, you know, the human error to, to, uh, to account for as well. So somebody builds something and you mistake an I for an L, nothing works. Why didn't it work? Um, you know, always when you're introducing, you know, new things, there are those elements of I can, I can only check it so much, but there are things that, that fall through. And that might go from, you know, 80% day one to 90% over time but I don't ever see it getting to the point where you're going to be able to catch and account for all of those particular uh, fall, th fall throughs of information. Yes? Yeah, and uh, you bring up you bring up one of the one of the consequences of going to more of a, you know, interactive chats and going into those sorts of things. You know, it might be tougher to to get somebody you know on the phone because they're looking at, you know, pushing you to other other areas. Um, you know, eventually, hopefully, on the on the sites you can figure out the, uh, uh, you know, the, the phone number to get to or you know have, you know actually go down to that. But yeah, we have seen that as some of the the you know consequences of the way things are shifting because you know I'm more apt to pick up a phone and call whereas chatbots are becoming um, relevant as well so um, you, one of the biggest holdups of those is understanding um, 
speaking. You know, you, you type how you talk. How do you take um, that sort of information and translate it into absolutes that a, that a machine can understand? So there's a whole bunch of things that go on to try to you know, understand what are you actually trying to ask. And I don't know, if, uh, I know some of the um, services that we have out there today, you can go figure out the status of everything. You can have them go try to, try to reset your information back from that. So yes, with, with moving forward, yeah, there are some things that um, you know, we might not necessarily continue to do um, the way that we've always, always done them. So, you know, where we're seeing more and more machine learning is, is you know, we've, we've seen it out in the social aspe aspects of it. We see it from, um, you know, the, the Amazons and the, and the Facebooks. Now we're starting to see it from the aspect of when things go wrong, right? So when an outage is, is happening and occurring, we're seeing more of that data and it's, uh, multipliers more data than you'd see from you know somebody's uh, somebody's interactions with the, with each other through a through a social media aspect of it, and it's starting to be able to take that information, structure it, which is kind of one of the biggest challenges. You're getting information from all different sorts of uh, of devices that are out there. You know whether it be a, a cell tower out here, whether it be a uh, a router in the closet, whether it be uh, you know a desktop on somebody's desk, and bring that information together in a way that somebody can uh, understand it, and the way that somebody can actually um, do something with it. So that's really you know kind of how we've taken the the machine learning aspect and starting to apply that to other areas that you know might have thought it's been there for a while. It really hasn't. It's really something that's you know, just starting to take hold, and that's you know, if you're interested in, in those sorts of areas, that's really where you know you can you can leverage those you know math skills, you know, uh, programming skills, uh, those sorts of areas to be able to you know provide that that next level of um, you know the world is more reliant on computers. How do we assure that they're functioning functioning correctly? And then that can ult ultimately move us to the area of well, there's always going to be a security aspect of it. So how do we take this information, apply it to um, when, uh, when a system's been, been compromised or when um, you know, data that might be fed into these isn't the data that you want to be fed in. So there's an aspect of that, that if somebody gets in and teaches your learning system the wrong things to do, um, that's always going to happen, and that's an area that that you know we're uh, very much involved in. And you know, to to the questions that have been asked, if it learns to do something and starts doing it, and that's not a good behavior, um, that's that's not the outcome that we're all looking for. Any other uh, questions on the topic, or? Um, any other school, like, you know, education-related things? I know I uh, kind of touched on those at the, uh, the beginning, but. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, there's the uh, the ability to take data sets from lots of different places and kind of send them over to call it a sandbox. And so those those sandbox areas take all the data, and that's really where you can start to to build out the logic that you want and test and validate those outcomes before you would ever move it to what we refer to as a production or a uh, live environment. So yeah, a lot of that data right now is simply just going into there, so people can really figure out what they want to teach it to do. And that's kind of, you know, really what I've seen is, you know, if, if I'm giving a, a, a sales presentation, somebody asks, do you do machine learning? I said, well, what do you want it to learn? 
you know, and, and that's, what, that's what everybody's kind of having a tough time answering the question to is, oh, I hadn't thought about that. I've heard of, you know, AI is kind of the buzzword. People say they do it. Well, what are they doing with it? And what do you want it to do? You know, we see it from, okay, well, I can help with service availability. I know that it can help me out with that. You know, what are the other areas that we really want to look into seeing what we want to do with it? Yeah, the, the, data, the data sets become huge and there are, um, you know, a whole bunch of different software s focuses out there that, um, that are doing that. So I'm involved with, with uh, one of these pieces of software actually that um, takes in information from here's stuff that's broken, here's stuff that's not working very well, here's stuff that um, users are reporting in because maybe it's stuff that I'm not able to monitor and measure and I mean it's it's yeah it's a lot of uh, processing resources and that's really where you know we and, we and Troy were talking a little bit you know if there's a whole lot of people in an area doing a lot of things you notice it slow down and that's really where kind of the cloud aspect of it comes in so designing systems that are able to self-scale to meet that need so um, you know that lunchtime, uh, going to be a lot busier than it's going to be the rest of the day, and then be able to scale back. So, you know, really on the, uh, the, the software and development size, they've gone from one computer supporting one application to one computer supporting a whole bunch of tiny applications. Anyone hear of Docker or containers? So in compute, those are computers within computers within computers, basically. So they're little tiny things that can very quickly and easily be taken out and moved on to another resource, used for that t time being, and then uh, reduced back down. And you know, that, again, that can um, be fed out from that machine learning aspect of it. So over time, I know here's when I need that extra r set of resources. Let me go pre-allocate it so that when everybody walks in, it's already available for them. And tail it off as everybody's leaving and going out. So again, um, how you can take those, those virtualized, those cloud capabilities, use the information that you're feeding in from a machine learning aspect of it, and you know, ultimately help, help, help the efficiencies, help people out, and um, that sort of thing, yeah. The Boeing, I'm not as familiar with that. I know that there was some software related. I don't know if there's, if they've taken kind of the learning aspects and put them into, um, I don't call it mission critical type systems, but those, um, it's a term for the, the systems like a airplane or a nuclear sub or that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot more that goes into that, so I'm not as familiar with that. Um, kind of the areas I, I've focused in on are the communication systems, so working with, um, you know, either the ones that are, you know, the Verizons, the U.S. Cellulars, the AT&Ts. I've worked with uh, the carriers, so they have all the buried pipe in the in the in the oceans or or in the uh, grounds, as well as um, some financial services companies, some um, what do I call it um, retails as well. So kind of seeing the aspects of of all those different areas and. You know, as different as they are, they're all kind of relying on the same underlying set of, of systems that are providing them communications access, that are providing them, you know, application access, and those sorts of areas. So again, you know, starting out with, here's what I wanted to do of, you know, designing these one little things. I've now learned how all of these little things then connect back together and how we're able to, uh, um, support all those different areas. As a real world example, this may be something you know, maybe not. That's okay. Um, recently I had my debit card number stolen, which is not good. I was camping and I had a text message from my bank that said, hey, we think this is not you sending money out of your account. How does that process happen? So this wasn't me noticing that money was gone. 
Mm-hmm. They caught it first within a few hours of like when it was sent down. So what is that? That's stuff that you would help design, right? Like the yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, again, I left out a critical one there for machine learning, right? It's there to also uh, help support us and help, you know, uh, us, you know, against against theft, against, uh, you know, security breaches and that sort of thing. So, so it's looking at, like, my history. Mm -hmm. That's how it's significant. Right. So, you know, it's not looking at your, you know, account information. It's just tracking here's everything that, that you've done. Here's your typical areas. You know, here's something that's um, out of it. It could be proximity-based, right? So you just made a purchase here, and you're going to make a purchase in Florida. That doesn't look right. So there's a whole bunch of things that, you know, those might not even be um, accepted to begin with. There's a lot of, um, they call it stand-in denials, where they'll deny transactions just because it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Or, you know, I get Yahoo notifications. Are you signing in from Ontario, Canada? Sometimes I am. Most of the time I'm not. You know, again, they're basing it off of your behavior and, again, learning what your typical things to do. And again, it's all for our benefit from a um, you know, security standpoint. Absolutely. So, since everyone's here, I'm just going to shoot out some questions. Since we have so many students that are in top three thinking about, you know, what's going to happen down the road, when you're hiring new grads, like, what kind of things do you look for? How do you get, what recommendations can you make um, to go from that resume stage actually getting to the interview or getting your foot in the door? Are there any tips that you would give to potential job seekers? Yeah, good, good question. I almost glossed over that from my, uh, um, when I was doing uh, solution engineering, I was hiring grads. That was the whole point. We had gone to um, a few uh, job job fairs and that sort of thing. I look for those that are um, looking to learn new things, looking to say, you know, I've you know now been through my higher education where I think I've kind of developed that ability to learn. I had somebody tell me that um, kind of early on was you have the ability to learn, right? You have the ability to take information you know and go figure it out and go figure out those, those next logical steps. So from a personal aspect of it, that's one of the things that I look at. Again, to the, to the point of you know, working, um, how are you going to work best? We were working in a you know, small company, small office, right? Is that going to be an environment that's good for you? Or do you need more regimented, um, regimented structure? I'm very much not a micromanager, so again, I was looking for things to um, see in people that would really have them look at look at things on their own and their ability to just kind of here's an idea, go with it. You know, if if you're more the you know structured type, you know that's probably a looking at more of a, a you know a big uh, company-based opportunity where, from what I've seen, um, is a lot more structured and regimented. Um, I kid you not, I was at a uh, customer once that um, was talking to the, my project manager and said, there's a problem with your status report. And the guy responds, really? What's that? He said, I used you know, Times New Roman 12 point font. The guy says back to him, but you used italics. So things like that that I've actually seen on, you know, go on is you know, for, so, for a lot of people that's really what you need and that's what you're going to use as your building blocks to make yourself successful. Other people, maybe not so much, right? So always be thinking about that, of what kind of structure helps me really accelerate my, uh, my growth and my you know, professional growth. And then really use that as the, as the building blocks to, to build out your career.